try it that way. Okay, so this is uh, Dr. Scrandall and I. We, um, I've got to tell you the story. We um, have been going to ESCRS meetings for 20 years, and his first wife and my wife just don't like traveling and just don't do it. So we would always travel, and you know, you would introduce yourself. I'd say, oh, this is my partner, Alan Crandall. <laughs> and so after a while, somebody finally came and said, oh, so you, know, you guys are partners. And, and they thought That's we were good. gay because we were always together. So basically, we had to say, this is my colleague, Alan Crandall. So then now, you know, Julie broke us up as a couple. So now that he's, he's married again, you know, Julie broke us up. So we're no longer a couple when we travel. But we still go look at, you know, castles and, you know, medieval things. You know, at least I can, I can advance with this. So we'll go ahead and we'll do that. All right, so here's the, this is one of the National Museums of, of Denmark. And again, they, you know, in Europe, all the National Museums all kind of look the same. But um, Denmark is kind of an interesting city. It's a, uh, Copenhagen, I mean, it's a good mix of old and new. And so you've got a lot of old, um, you know, towers and old medieval buildings. But in between, they've got a lot of really ultra-modern glass and, and interesting buildings on the waterfront. So as we go through our tour, we'll spend some time there. And so this just shows that the sun was, was going down on the edge. So we're going to talk about Kajutaiba today. And so Ashley, since you're in the first seat and you're yawning there. Um, stretching. 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 Yeah. Stretching. Ah, so tell me about the, the various parts of the Kajutaiba. Okay, so there's uh, bowl bar for the seal and the healthy world. Okay, so bowl bar means easy to remember against the bowl. And so what we think of as conj, you know, on top of the, the sclera is the bowl bar kind of town. And that blends right in with the cornea at the limbus. And then for the seal, boy, I don't know why my laser pointer isn't working, but to the right lower corner there, you can see the fornix where the country cover reflects on itself. And then the part of the cards that we often forget about that we talked about last week is lining the inside surface of the eyelid, the so-called palpebral conjunctiva. And so the palpebral conjunctiva, what are these little white spots in there? Goblet cells. Goblet cells. And what do goblet cells produce? Mucin. Mucin. Okay, so the further away you get from the limbus, the more goblet cells there are. So you don't usually see goblet cells up near the limbus, but if you get near the fornix on the palpebral conge or over into the caruncle or the lateral cantal area, you get a lot more goblet cells. And they make mucin. Why is mucin important? Because it makes up the tear film. Okay. Uh, Chris, how many different layers are there to the tear film? And what are the layers? There's three. There's the mucin layer, the, the water tear part, and then Okay. So the reason that the goblet cells are important is if you look at the surface of the cornea and the conjunctiva with EM, they're not smooth. They've got little microfilaments sticking out all over the place. And if you put water on them, which is what aqueous is, it just runs off. And so basically, if you put some mucin kind of intermixed between those inner digits, it allows it to smoothly spread out and not just evaporate or spread out. So it makes the surface of the eye more wettable. And then, of course, the aqueous part of the tears is what we usually think of as tears. And then the final layer that we don't think much about is the oil layer. And that's what the meibomian vines make that we had looked at last week when we looked at the eyelids. And so that really keeps the tears from evaporating. And the oil kind of coats them and keeps it from evaporating. So any disruption of any one of those three layers can give you dry eyes. All right, Nico, what are we looking at right here? So this is an external photograph of... Uh Left eye, and I see a raised yellowish white lesion by the nasal limbus. Um, this could be um, my differential is a derm dermal uh, dermoid, a little dermoid origin. All right. So, what if I tell you this patient is five? It's five. Um, the uh, dermoid. Okay, so that, it's good that you said that because there's a term in the literature called limbal dermoid and it confuses everybody to no end because you have dermoid cysts in the orba, they call this a limbal dermoid, you say what, what does that mean? And so the proper terminology for this, and I want to try to 
get you guys to start doing this because it's going to start showing up on boards is, is this is called a limbal dermal chorostoma. What does the term chorostoma mean? Uh, it means um, mature tissues, uh, normal mature tissues growing in a uh, different site. Exactly. So chorostoma means it's not tumor tissue, it's, it's normal tissue, it's a growth of normal tissue, but in a site where they shouldn't be there as opposed to hemartoma, which means growth of normal tissue at a site that they could be, but it's just an abnormal growth. So chorostoma means you have... No, let's not install the Apple software. Thank you, since this isn't even an Apple. So what this is is it's a chorostoma, meaning it's a growth of abnormal tissue, I mean growth of normal tissue in a place where they shouldn't normally be. So when you look at these dermoids under the microscope, let's see, uh, Sean, what kind of tissue are we looking at right here? This is actually that lesion. Or what things are we seeing right here? Right, so there's some epithelium up. up. There's some. Right, this is not going to let me do anything. It's not going to go back. It's not going to go back. Not gonna let me do anything. Okay, so so we've got some epithelium up above. What is this thing we're looking at in the middle here? How about this thing right here? It's got a sebaceous gland next to it. Yeah, it's a hair follicle. So do we normally have hair follicles in the conch? No. So, you know, these, these lesions often have hairs growing out of them. They've got the sebaceous glands. And then, and then we look right here, a couple of other kinds of tissue in here. Let's just come around the corner here, Tara. Um, so it looks like there's kind of in the middle here, there's glands. Mm -hmm. So what is this stuff again? Glands. Glands, all right. And then this looks very strange. Let's go to a higher power. All right, here's the glands. What kind of glands are we looking at right here? Ecri glands. glands. And so these are like little lacrimal glands or sweat glands. And so again, you shouldn't have glands in the conjunctiva. And then to the right, some weird stuff. What is that? Go higher. Something you wouldn't expect to see in the conge. Well, kind of a very dense connective tissue. This is cartilage. And so these are very interesting lesions because you can have um, glands in them, you can have muscle in them, you can have fat, you can have fat in there, but you can also have things like cartilage. And so these are very much you know, a growth of, of normal tissue in an abnormal place. And so these are very interesting lesions. What is an entity that you need to memorize for boards that's associated with limbal dermal chorostomas in kids? A syndrome. Again, the iron curtain descends across the cerebral cortex. Chris? Golden Haar syndrome. So you really need to remember that because these kids can have these limbal dermal chorostomas, but they can have funny teeth, they get these little preauricular skin tags and other things in their bones, and so they love asking about Golden Haar syndrome. So know that that can be associated with these limbal dermal chorostomas. All right, uh, Lee, what are we seeing right here? Overexposed picture, sorry. <laughs> so it's an external photo of a hyperpigmented individual. Um, uh, as you said, it's overexposed, but it looks like it's minus material. It's overexposed, but so this is the lesion here, ignoring the overexposure. So it's 
something you see in every single Utah who's native when you look at the stuff. So Exactly. So this is a pinguiculum. We see this in, in everybody. And what's the underlying cause for pinguiculum? Exactly. And, and what causes that? Exactly. So it's UV exposure. Because we're at altitude here, because we have 300 sunny days here, people ski and do outdoorsy things, you see pinguicula all the time. And then, of course, the pinguicula is, you know, cohort. Region. What's the difference between the two? It's the invasion across the land surface onto the conch, so it encroaches into the Exactly. So they're really pretty much the same entity. It's just the pinguicula is technically over the sclera still in the conjunctiva, and the pterygium has crossed the limbus and gone onto the cornea. So we look at the path. You mentioned one thing that's common with these. Exactly. So when you look, you get some solar elastosis. The connective tissue starts to undergo almost the elastotic degeneration. You get basophilic degeneration, a smudgy blue-gray degeneration. What is this magenta-colored stuff in here? It's actually calcium. Okay. And so these can sometimes calcify. So when you look at these with the slit lamp, you can see little specks of white underneath them. So the They'll have, you know, this dense connective tissue, but they will also have these little white flecks of calcium. So the important thing to differentiate is when you're looking at somebody, especially an old vet who's a rancher who's out in the sun a lot, the question is, is this a pterygium or is this a disease of the epithelium? And you really want to be able to tell that apart. So when you look with the slit lamps very carefully, in these pterygia, the epithelium is thin and the pathology is under the epithelium. It's in the substantia propria. Whereas you look at a say a squamous cell carcinoma, or one of the precursors of squamous cell carcinoma, the disease is in the epithelium. So the epithelium looks really thick and gelatinous. So you want to be really careful when you call something a pterygium, and just look at them real quickly. Look carefully and make sure that it's really a pterygium and not something else when you see them. All right, what do we see in here, Reese? Um, so it's an inverted upper eyelid. If you were to shine a Fenoff head next to that, what do you think that would show? I think it would probably be cystic. It would be cystic, exactly. And so, what's the most important layer we need to look at if we see a cystic structure? The cystic. The lining. And what do we see as the lining in this one? So it's a stratified swing that's not keratinized at the dome. You know, what do we have in the middle there? These little grayish spaces. Like some goblet cells. Goblet cells. And so, what kind of a cyst is this? Exactly. So we call it an epithelial inclusion cyst because for some reason surface epithelium gets underneath the surface and starts to grow. And so by definition something had to have happened, either a trauma or a surgery or something. But once in a while they get these people and they swear nothing's ever happened to them. So I don't know how it gets there, but if the surface epithelium gets under the, you know, the epithelium and the substantial appropriate, it'll grow into a cyst. And so when you see a cyst, you want to look at the cyst lining to tell what it is. All right, back to Ashley. What are we looking at right here? Uh, so this is an external photograph of the palpi volcange, um, and it looks like um, there is, a, the, it looks like there's a cobblestone appearance. Okay. Um, so some sort of uh, conjunctivitis causing this. What do we call these things? Form the cobblestones. So these don't look like they have a, a central vessel, so follicles. Exactly. So these are follicles, and that's an important differentiating point. Follicles don't have a big vessel in the center. Papillae do. So if you look at these, these look like follicles. They're these bumps. They may have blood vessels around it, but not popping up in the center. So these are actually follicles. And what are the follicles comprised of? Um, like lymphocytic centers? Exactly. So they've got lymphocytes, and you can sometimes even get, they almost look like follicles elsewhere in the body. You get a little bit of 
larger paler staining lymphocytes in the center, darker lymphocytes surrounding them. So, what's a differential diagnosis of follicles in the, in the, on that conjunctiva inferiorly? Um, I mean, I, I, cla classically, there's a difference between the two, but in reality, there's it can be early any kind of infectious infectious cause. What kind? Um, viral. Uh, So, so viral, you know, viral is the most common. If you're gonna, if you're gonna think of something, think viral, not bacteria. Usually, you think viral, and so you can think viral. So that's one category: infectious, viral, and then other weird viruses. Chris, what's another cause for follicles? Uh, allergic reaction. Allergic reaction. So that's the other big one. You know, when people have these allergies, they get these follicles all over the place, and so you want to think infectious, viral, or weird things. You want to think. You know, allergic allergic reaction can cause these follicles. And here's a close up. You see the paler staining lymphocytes in the center, surrounded by the smaller, darker staining lymphocytes around them. So just a classic follicle. All right. Now this is a little bit different. We're looking at these, and so what Chris you looked at, you got the easy one. Now Nico, what's different about these? So um, there's blood vessels in the center. All right, so what would uh, these be? Excuse me. What would these be then with these the blood? These would be follicles. These would be, these would be? Papillae. Papillae, oh, exactly. So you see the papillae, each one of these little bumps has that little blood vessel coming up in the middle of it. And when you look at these pathologically, again, you see they have this bump coming out, but you see the little blood vessels coming in the center. So what's the most common cause for? Papillae. Papillae. Um, I think of uh, viral conjunctivitis. Well, usually not. What what else? Um, foreign body. Yeah, a reaction to something. A reaction to something, and, and I don't know if you guys ever rotate through contact lens clinic, but this is the bane of, of contact lens wear is, is GPC, giant papillary conjunctivitis, and so you. Look at one, I'm sorry, I took this picture, it's, it's bad, but we flipped over the eyelid and they were not amused and we took a picture of it. And so, these are these giant papillae and they're usually on the upper lid on the inside surface and so these are the bane of contact lens wearers. And they'll come in with these vague symptoms, you know. Ah, I wear my contacts and then my eyes start to hurt later in the day and I get this stringy mucusy stuff in there. And, and then you flip them over and you see these big cobblestones in here, these giant papillae here. And so, this is thought to be a reaction to something on the contact, be it proteins that are deposited there, be it preservatives in the solutions they use, be it something that's on there. And so the problem is, is you have to treat these with, you know, drops that, that calm the inflammation. You've got to keep people out of their contacts. And so you have someone who's a minus eight, they're not amused that they're going to be out of their contacts for two months. So this can be really, really no fun. And then you have to have them check out all their solutions, buy solutions that don't have any kind of, of preservatives in them, you want to buy hypoallergenic solutions, you want to have them change their contacts regularly so they don't get a protein buildup. So this is the GPC, giant papillary conjunctivitis. Shrab, I see you hiding back there. So what, what are we seeing here? Some bumps in the limbus. This is a 14-year-old male, and it's April. Am I giving you enough hints? And it really itches. It could be like the These are actually follicles, but they're right at the limbus, and so there's a condition called vernal conjunctivitis. Vernal meaning spring. And so you see this in especially young adolescent boys, and they get this really intense itching with this. And you see these bumps at the limbus. So this is, we just call it limbal vernal. But it's the same idea. It's these, these follicles at the limbus. And so this is limbal vernal. All right. Let's see. Um, Tara, we're pulling this guy's lid out, and we're looking at this lesion there. What are we seeing there? Yeah, 
yeah, it's kind of got a stock to it. It's a big cauliflower kind of sticking out there. It's a little bit floppy. It's got a stock to it. And then we look at it and we see this in the pathology. So what do you see in here at low power? So um, it looks like it's lined by uh, non-characterized uh, All right, so it does have kind of a thin conjunctival looking epithelium here on the surface. Okay, so there's some scattered inflammatory cells. What are all those little red spaces? Uh, blood vessels. So this lesion's got a ton of little tiny blood vessels in it. It's got some scattered inflammatory cells. It's got a lot of white space, a lot of just, just fluid in it. White space. And we look at a close-up here, and you see it's a mixture of inflammatory cells. There's PMNs in there. There's lymphocytes in there, there's lots of blood vessels in there, there's a lot of fluid and really loose connective tissue. What do we call this lesion? Is this a granuloma? That's part of the, the word. That's half the answer. <laughs> Let's check them out. Well, we're giving you lots of hints. So. This is one of those you just have to memorize. This is a what, Chris? A pyogenic granuloma. Now, this is one of those stupid double misnomers that gets into the literature that you have to remember. All right, so double misnomer. Neither of those two words are correct. So pyogenic means fever-inducing. You know, so that means an infectious thing. So it's not pyogenic. It's not infectious. Granuloma means giant cells, epithelioid cells. It's not a granuloma. It's actually granulation tissue. So we think of it as kind of an exuberant healing response, almost like a keloid, you know, of the conjure of the lid. And so it's a double misnomer. It's not pyogenic, it's not a granuloma, but that's what it's called in the literature. So pyogenic granuloma, it's thought to be reactive, granulation tissue. People will often have a history of something getting in their eye or some kind of minor surgery or minor trauma or something. And so that person that we showed you previously that had that lesion grossly, that guy was one of the people who worked in the hospital, and he, he's the guy who pulls all those cables through the ceiling that you see on the ladders, and something up there dropped into his eye and triggered this reaction. So it's a granulation tissue reaction. Isn't, right? that, isn't that appearance normally more kind of red orange? It's kind of red, exactly. It's kind of red, but it can be white because there's just a lot of fluid in there, a lot of loose tissue. So it's not dense, it's not fibrotic, it's very loose and edematous. All right, Chris, what are we seeing here? Uh, so it's a very injected kind of type of... Um, it's like it's elevated with like some chemosis with it as well. Yeah, it looks pretty diffuse, kind of diffusely elevated. So again, you want to think of like differential diagnoses before you jump, jump right the path. What could give you kind of a diffuse Looking so the viral infection um, would be at least high up on that differential. Um, what else? So you want to look at general categories. Infectious, you know, could be infectious. What else? Uh, I mean, so like an autoimmune condition, I guess I could do that. But or you could say reactive. I mean, maybe yeah. this is funny. This looks a little bit too vascular for pyogenic granuloma right. or something. And there's a third category. We could have just a diffuse raised lesion of the conch. Here's the pathology. How about infiltrate data? Uh, yeah. So sometimes you can get, now these are very rare of the conjunctival. But what kind of cells are we seeing right here? Like yeah, a whole sheet of lymphocytes. And so you can get conch lymphomas. 
Now, usually they're associated with an orbital lymphoma that's come forward, but rarely you can even just get chronic lymphoma. Are they usually that type of ring? No, usually they're, they're quote, salmon okay. color, and salmon so means what, what pinky? Green. Yeah, that looks redder, so usually they're like more pink than red, but they could be diffusely elevated under the conjunct gut, so always think of that. And when you look at this, you know, when you look at a lymphoma as opposed to a follicle or lymphoid hyperplasia, the way I like to describe it is you just take a handful of lymphocytes and you just smear them on the slide. So they all look the same. There's no follicles forming in there. There's no B cells mixed in with them. It's all just a handful of lymphocytes that's smeared across. So conjugal lymphomas, you always want to watch for them. They always call them, quote, salmon color. And I said, I'm, I think a salmon is pink, but not quite sure what that means. So if you see like a germinal center in there, do you think more reactive? You think more reactive, exactly, rather than lymphoma. When we get to orbit, we're going to talk about, you know, lymphoid hyperplasia and reactive lesions versus lymphoma. So we'll talk about that a lot in orbit. And then this is just one of the immunoperoxidase stains just to show that they virtually all stain, you know, B cell, lambda, or whatever. And that's what's most common is, is low-grade B cell lymphoma. All right, Lee, what are we looking at right here? you be worried about here? Yeah, so you'd be worried about what kind? Squamous cell or maybe a pre-cancer type. Now what's the first thing you want to do with this patient? You want to get that cataract out because I'm going to wipe that out. You want to take out that cataract before the cornea melts down and sign them up quick. So we're getting the cataract. But you see this just as you said, it's gelatinous. And so as opposed to a Pterygium, that epithelium isn't thin and there's not all the connective tissue under it. This looks gelatinous and the epithelium looks thicker, so you're really worried about some kind of a, a carcinoma going on. Here's another way these can look. Again, you see that kind of gelatinous look to it. You see that the epithelium is thickened. It starts at the limbus and then it can grow onto the cornea or it can grow out away from the limbus. So we do a surgery to remove it and we get this picture. What do we see in here? So a little keratin on the surface, that's abnormal. Sweat cell. Um, and it looks like it's an acantiotic. Um, there's a lot of um, um, or uh, just atypia associated with the layers. Okay, uh, so spreading through the uh the basal layer convoids, so it looks like it's probably a severe uh atypia. What do we call this lesion? So CIN. CIN, and that stands for? Um, so it's a conjunctival intra intraepithelial lymphoma. Exactly. So the key thing here is this is a carcinoma in situ, meaning it has not gone beyond the basement membrane. It's strictly within the epithelium. And so the key thing here is that the epithelial basement membrane is still intact. So these changes are all in the epithelium. And there's Nucleoli, there's loss of normal maturation, there can be mitotic figures, there can be keratinization both on the surface and even deeper. So you see these little pink areas in here, those are all dyskeratosis, keratin down deep where there shouldn't be any. But it's all in the epithelium. And so when we describe these CINs, what are the three different classifications we do? So mild, moderate, severe. Exactly. So simple, mild, moderate, severe. And what denotes mild? Exactly. So we look at the degree of epithelium that's involved with the atypical cells starting with the basal layer. So mild is the lower third, moderate's up to two thirds, severe is more than two thirds. So this would definitely be severe. You've got these changes going all the way up to the surface. And here you can see. This is the basement membrane here. It's still completely intact. But look, here's nucleoli all over the place. 
this, here's the weird mitotic figure starting to split in half. And so you see that the maturation is disordered. It doesn't normally lay out nicely. And this goes all the way up, you know, 90% thickness. So this is a CIM with marked dysplasia. And here again is another one. Look at the multiple nucleoli in that little center cell. And so you can see it can be very dysplastic looking, but it's still intraepithelial. So we want to look at that basic membrane very carefully when we look at these. All right, what do we see in here, Reese? Um, it's an really elevated rootoplatic plaque kind of growing under the cornea with a lot of kind of beefy associated conjunctival vessels. Okay, so again, at the limbus, whitish, you know, leukoplakia, white plaque looking lesion, thickened gelatinous epithelium, probably some keratin on there. And we look at this, and what's the difference between this and the previous one? So this looks like it's broken through the base of the membrane. Exactly. So you see the base of the membrane is up there, and look, here's these abnormal cells down here. So these cells have now broken through the base of the membrane. So this has gone from being a CIN to actually being a superficially invasive Squamous cell, exactly. So this is now a superficially invasive squamous cell. Sometimes these can be quite extensive. What are these things down here? Little worlds of keratin. Exactly. So just like the squamous cell carcinoma of the eyelid, you can get keratin whorls, keratin pearls, and so you see these growing under the epithelium in the substantia propria. And so this is a more extensive squamous cell carcinoma. And here you can see on the close-up, there's that keratin whorl, keratin pearl. You see the nucleoli, you see the clumped chromatin, the bizarre sizes and shapes, the pleomorphism. So this is a squamous cell carcinoma. And sometimes they can even invade down into the, what is this tissue here? Sclera. Sclera. So you can even go into the episclera, the superficial sclera. So, these can be, you know, you just think of them as surface neoplasia, but they can actually go into the orbit, they can spread along the nerves, back into the brain, and so these can be aggressive if you leave them alone and, and you miss them. And so they can go in all the way to the episclera, they can even go back into the orbit. So squamous cell carcinoma. And here we have, boy, this is a good one here. Actually, what kind of tissue is this thing I'm showing you here? It's a big round thing in the middle. Uh, is that just is that also keratin? I don't know. Believe it or not, that's a big nerve. Oh, okay. And so the reason I'm showing this, this is one of Whoopi's favorite topics. We talk about this at Orbit Conference at least once a year. When these squamous cells spread, for some reason, they can go along the nerves. And so you can get people with a superficial squamous cell, either lead or conge, and then they can also get them going back through the orbit, through, along the nerves, and they can go back even into the brain. And so these, for some reason, have a tendency to go along the nerves, which means they can have pain associated with them. And then eventually, if they can invade along the nerve and disrupt the nerve, you can get numbness associated with them. So when these spread, they can often spread along the nerves and back into the head. So you want to get these before they get to this point. And there's a close-up again of these um, tumor cells here going along the nerve here, these funny tumor cells. So you want to remember that because they can actually go back into the orbit and go back into the brain. All right, Chris, what are we seeing here? So this is an external photograph of uh, looks like the left eye uh, with the hyperpigmented spots um, turned throughout, some smaller ones nasally, some bigger ones laterally. But big beefy blood vessels feeding the area laterally, um, and then hyperpigment right around the lumbar region. So, so what could this be? Uh, part of me wonders if those hyperpigment these are actually the area that's like scrotomalacious and thinning, and that's the RPE coming through. That's, that could look like this. Now let's say this person's 30 instead of, you know, 80. Um, What if I say they've got some funny pigmented things in their lid on this side, too? So, do you think, uh, like, Port Weinstein kind of thing, like, look how funny pigmented things? 
No, not not reddish looking, more candy um, or so reddish looking. Uh, like melanoma picture? Um, not sure. Okay. This is actually a picture of, of what we call a nevus of oda, a patient of nevus of oculocutaneous melanosis. And so the reason I really love this picture, this is a really good picture, because if you look, they've got this superficial pigment at the limbus, which is tan or brown, and very common. But if you look at this, it's kind of grayish almost. And the reason that it's grayish is that is actually not on the surface of the conjunctiva. That's actually below the sclera. And so you can get this oculocutaneous melanosis where you get these lesions actually in the sclera, so they are below the sclera. It's actually in the conjuncti in the um, choroid. So what's interesting is these lesions don't go on and form melanoma of the conj. They can have melanoma of the choroid. Because remember, this isn't the conj, because the superficial, the reason I showed you those little superficial ones at the limbus is that's a total, um, totally separate lesion right there. And so this is where you get these lesions that are underneath the sclera but can also be in the lid and the skin, and they're usually on one side. And so that's the oculocutaneous melanosis. All right, Nico. So this is an external photograph. Um, you have the right eye, and what I see um, by the temporal limbus is a, a brown, brownish, flat uh, patch. Uh, and there seems to be some vessels or just uh, prominent uh, vessels. Okay, so what would you think? What would your differential here be? My differential would be um, a pinguacula versus uh, like a nevus, like a pinguacula oxidic nevus. Okay, so what if I tell you this patient is 13? Uh, and this could be a general nevus. Exactly. So the usual history here is that, um, you know, you ask the mom, how long has this been here? Well, it's been here for a few years, but it's getting worse, or it's getting bigger, or it's getting darker. And that's usually the history. So these can even be, some people speculate they're congenital, but these start very, very young. And then as the kids hit adolescence and the beginning of puberty, these can grow and they can darken. So when they're younger, they'll often look almost pink. And then as they hit adolescence, they'll start to pigment. And we're seeing these younger and younger now. Kids are hitting puberty younger and younger. And, and so some people theorize it's, it's the diet now. You know, kids are really well fed now, so they start puberty early. My, my conspiracy theory that I'm sure, you know, President Trump believes in is that it's the hormones that are in the beef, you know, in the McDonald's burgers. And so they give all these animals hormones so that they grow faster. And so I think the hormones are having kids hit puberty earlier. So. That's the conspiracy theory side of it. So again, don't, don't memorize that for boards, okay? <laughs> so, but in any event, kids, it's probably due to nutrition. Kids are just hitting puberty earlier. And as a result, you're seeing these lesions change in, in size and change in pigment. And so it starts to bother them, and then they bring them in. So I made another um, sexist comment there against guys. You can do your own kind. I said, so mom gives you the history. Okay, does dad ever bring these kids in? No. It's always mom. Now, would dad even notice this? No. I mean, the eyeball would have to be coming out of the head for dad to read and say, oh yeah, there's something wrong with the kid here. Mom, it's like, if this gets like a single petechia on it, oh my God, it's changed from yesterday. We better get him seen the triage right away. And so you'll see this. And so mom will usually bring them in. But the problem is, is when kids start to hit middle school, other kids start to notice things. And so if you've got a little thing on your eye, kids are brutal, they'll notice them. And so that is reasons to remove them, aside from, you know, mom being nervous, is, is that the kids are starting to notice them. And so we look right here, and here's the pathology. What are we seeing here? Um, so I see, I see like a kind of a like cystic spaces, large cystic spaces. All right. Large cystic spaces, and what, what's and the lining of the cystic spaces here? That's epithelium. Exactly. It's a surface epithelium. So you see all these epithelial lined cysts. Now, gosh, I wish I had this on a laser pointer working. I've got like three in my desk, but I'm not going to run up and grab them because I thought this would work. But if you look way at the top, you see little nests 
of melanocytes. Where are they located? Um, I think it's in the subepithelial. Well, if you look at the ones, especially right in the middle there, they're not only subepithelial, but they're right at the base of the layer of the epithelium. So what, what area do we call that? The junction. So you see melanocytes at the junction, and then you see melanocytes down in the substantial propius. So what would we call this? Compound. Compound amoeba. So amoeba, you can get melanocytes initially at the junction, but then when they start to grow down into the substantial propria, they'll be in both places. We call that compound. Eventually, they will lose their connection with the junction and just become subepithelial. So they'll be kind of the equivalent of a dermal nevus in the skin. You know, we call the subepithelial amoebas. And those are important because once the melanocytes lose their connection to the junction, they really lose their malignant potential. And so it's important seeing these cysts because in kids, especially when they've been there a long time, you will see these little epithelial line cysts. And the way I remember it is the melanocytes come from which embryologic layer? Almost. Neural crest. Neural crest. So the melanocytes migrate out from the neural crest, they go to the junction, they start growing, then they grab epithelium and yank it down with them when they grow down. So you get these epithelial line sits. Now, is that what happens? No. <laughs> so don't remember that for porch, but that's a good way to remember it. Okay. Neural crest, melanocytes, they start to grow at the junction, and then they start dropping down, they grab epithelium while they go down. And so when you often see these epithelial line cysts, that's a tip off that this has been there a long time, maybe even congenital. So that's really reassuring in kids because when general pathologists look at these, sometimes these melanocytes look just a little bit active. And so we'll often get a, a referral that says, you know, I'm uncomfortable about this. And you see these cysts, it kind of gives you, you know, it, it kind of gives you a little bit of, of um, confidence that these have been there for a while. And here's the lining of the cyst. It's surface epithelium, it can even have goblet cells in it which is very interesting. And then here are the melanocytes at the junction. Now the thing that fools you in these, especially in, in younger kids, is they often aren't pigmented. And so they, they won't look brown or tan, they'll often just look pink. And so there's the melanocytes growing at the junction. And then here you have at the junction and then down into the substantial propria. So compound nevus. And then last but not least, oh man, I can't insult my fellows here, so I don't know who took this one, but again, we've got to get their you know, PRK redone. Um, so you can see right here, the melanocytes are now down deep. So they're just in the substantial propius, so almost like the dermal nevus. And so these do not lead to melanoma. All right, uh, Trav, what are we seeing here? Does that look alarming at all? Yeah, you can see it's kind of superficial. It's not thick and it's uniformly brown. It doesn't have different sizes, shapes, colors. And so th this is, I tell this story every year, so I guess I get sick of it eventually, but I love this story. So this lady's about 40, and on an anxiety scale of one to 10, she's about a 15. And so I talked to her, I said, no, this is not anything malignant. We don't have to worry about this. What we're gonna do, we're gonna take a picture of it now, we'll have you come back again in six months and we'll compare. But in the meantime, if it changes, let me know. And she's very nervous, you know, a half hour worth of questions. And so I'm sitting home watching the, you know, weather news at 10.15 and the phone rings and some of the residents on call and say, did you see so-and-so today? And I said, oh, yeah, I did. Well, she's here in the ER. It's changed. <laughs> and so she wanted it off. So for her mental health, we took it off. And, and it was good that we took it off because we usually don't remove these. And in fact, when we looked at the path, what do we see in here? So if you look, they're actually along the basilar layer. So you see these melanocytes along the basilar layer coming along the basilar layer, but they're just in the basilar layer. They're not atypical, they're not extending up into the epithelium. So what do we call this entity? 
three layers, three letters, girl's name. So this is PAM, which stands for Primary Acquired Melanosis. And so these are even more commonly seen than what we see in terms of nevi. So this is PAM, girl's name, primary acquired melanosis. And when we subdivide PAM, we divide it into PAM without atypia, PAM with atypia. So this is what we call PAM without atypia. And this is what it would look like if you see someone who has racial pigmentation at the limbus. And that looks exactly this way too. And so it's not anything atypical. It doesn't extend into the epithelium. It's just along the base of the And so it's, it's PAM without atypia. And these are not pre-malignant. And there you see the close-up, the nine melanocytes along the base of the layer. So the only way to tell the difference between the like, racial pigmentation and pain would be clinical history. Exactly. Oh, and, and just, and, but they look the same. Right. They look the same. So if you see the PAM in, you know, a nervous 40-year-old Caucasian woman, then obviously that's different than, you know, a, a 60-year-old African-American guy. But you can even see, even in uh, Hispanics and Asians, you can see pigment around the limbus. Yeah, I guess technically purists would say no, but I would still call the same. You can often see some secondary melanosis with the long-standing turgium or pinguicula, so it's not uncommon. And racial melanosis, that's also, that we also call that bad benign acquired melanosis. Exactly, it's exactly the same thing. Yep. Same thing. Pathologically, it looks like PAM without atypia. Tara, this is a little different looking. What are we seeing now? More concerning? Um, yes, I think it's more concerning, and also this is like a lighter skinned person. Okay, so we look at the pathology here, and here we have these melanocytes, except that the difference here is they've taken over the whole epithelium. And not only that, look at the cells here. What's going on right here? What is this? Exactly. So there's nucleoli, there's pleomorphism, some are big, some are smaller, and they've taken over the whole epithelium. So this is now PAM with atypia. And we can subdivide the atypia into how extensive it is, but the reason that this is important is this can be premalignant. So if you look at 100 cases of conj melanoma, 80 of them will have pre existing PAM and probably 10 of them would maybe have a pre-existing nevus and the rest, who knows what causes them to come on. But this doesn't mean that 80% of PAM with atypia cause melanomas, but if you see a melanoma of the conj, if you look carefully, you'll see about 80% of them will have some pre-existing PAM with atypia. So it's important to recognize this because this is pre-malignant. And especially here, if you look at this guy, what are, what are these right here, ignoring the pigment? right here. Um, it looks like yeah, so what do we call that when the conj is kind of scarred to the lid? Um. It's a symblepheron. And so symblepheron. So what that tells you is this is a vet, and he's had multiple surgeries for PAM that keeps popping up. And so there's scarring there, but the key thing here is you see those atypical areas up there, but then when you look down here, and this is one thing I really want you to remember, if you see PAM in the fornix, it's melanoma until proven otherwise. So once it's in the fornix, you can't mess around with it. You've got to get that out of there because it, it's melanoma unless it's proven otherwise. The other stuff on the bulbar cards, you see that the patients had multiple surgeries before and some scarring. And the problem is, is you have this PAM with atypia up here in the epithelium, but then it comes down here and then, oops, it's breaking through the basement membrane down here. And so this is pre-existing PAM with atypia leading to malignant melanoma of the conjunctiva. 
and you can see on close up, some of these cells can be really bizarre looking. I mean, look at those cells in the middle, huge nucleus, clumped chromatin, big body there, and so very aggressive looking cells, and these can be aggressive, so you want to make sure to not let them spread, you know, into the orbit or out of the eye. So if you have melanoma, again, 80% have a pre-existing pan with atypia, 10% arise from anemia. So this is malignant melanoma of the conjunctiva that arose from pre-existing pan with atypia. And of course, just for fun, we did a stain. This is called an HMB45. This is just an immunoperoxidase stain that stains from melanocytes. And so just to show you that these are all melanocytes. And if you don't treat these, this is what can happen. So we love showing gross pictures at, you know, 8 in the morning. Isn't that fun? So this is what can happen. And so this was a, a person who ignored it. And at this point, you can see that it's on the lid, it's all through the orbit, and so this patient had to have an exenteration, which is not a very nice surgery. So melanoma can be aggressive, so you really want to be careful and, and you know, get on top of it and remove any suspicious tissue. All right, so it's interesting. For some reason, this looks like the winged horses on top of the Brandenburg Gate in, in Berlin, but this is in, in Copenhagen. So have a great Christmas. I don't know who scheduled the lecture on the 27th, but they did, so I apologize for that. But, you know, next Tuesday, 7 a.m., day after official holiday Christmas is cornea. So, again, I apologize, but just to make things easier, I will bring whatever sweets we have left over from Christmas for you guys to munch on. So, don't eat breakfast, bring your appetite, and we'll do that next Tuesday morning. Okay.